Each of these handmade dioramas tells a story from a once thriving planet that has fallen slowly into disrepair. That planet is Aegis. And today, we're traveling back down to the planet's surface to the sprawling Aegean Sea. I'll take you along the journey of conceptualizing, designing, then scratch building with wood, paper, and plastic this floating sky market, whose crew is about to make a most interesting discovery. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. Since embarking on this world-building project last year, I've had a lot of time to mull over its history and lore. Of course, it's much easier imagining a thing than turning an idea into a tangible object, so it's a constant process of sifting through concepts to decide on the next build. For this one, I wanted to craft a giant floating market. For the second build in this series, I made a somewhat similar structure, so I had a basic aesthetic to work from. But this time, I wanted a complex interior, lights, and plenty of tiny details to achieve a more convincing look. I'm taking lots of inspiration from Asian architecture here, especially older Japanese buildings, as seen in the design of the roofs and windows. And while this signage was later changed, the original characters here read yogwale, or fish market, in the original language I'm developing for this world. With the pencil sketch done, I moved on to the penwork using these waterproof felt tip pens. I started with a brush tip for the structure's main outlines, then moved on to finer tips for these smaller details like the windows, wood slats, and gratings. For coloring, I started with this cobalt blue for the terracotta roofs, helping to further emphasize the Asian inspiration. And this time, instead of just smearing everything with pigment, I let the paper show through in parts to give the roof a bit of shine. There is of course no real reason to go through this extra trouble for something that's just a small stepping stone toward the physical build, but I've learned to slow down and find joy even in the smaller aspects of these projects, and incrementally improving my watercolor skills was a goal for this build. By applying this more minimal painting technique, combined with using different brushes for added texture in the painting and different colors for more depth, I ended up with a concept painting I'm really proud of. But before building started, I needed to carefully organize each phase of the building process. I did this by photocopying the concept art, labeling each section, then meticulously planning out the build phases. With that done, it was time to roll up my sleeves and get started. Now, I know it's a little untraditional to use Adobe Animate for template design, but I haven't yet found a quicker way. I love how easy it is to draw shapes, connect lines, move points, all while keeping everything neat and aligned. After getting one face of the building designed, it was a simple thing to connect the points for the adjacent sides. And if you're wondering about the colors, the blue lines here are for cutting, while the red lines are guides for engraving. Also, for the first time ever, I've made nearly every part of this structure into a template available for purchase and download, and you can find my design files along with a detailed instruction manual on gamebuilds.com. If you don't have a laser engraver or other method of automated cutting, I'd recommend simply printing the sheets out on thick cardstock straight from your printer and cutting by hand. It won't look exactly the same, but it's a great start if you're thinking of getting into building dioramas and want to start off small and inexpensively. With the pieces cut and ready to go, I dry fit everything together just to double check my work. I then super glued the panels made from one millimeter chipboard to the wood, which is two millimeter basswood. One thing I didn't account for here, however, was the thickness of the walls. So to compensate for this, I made sure that the panels on the front and back walls had a bit of overhang to them, which you can see here. These triangular gussets were added which helped keep the walls at a 90 degree angle and ensure straight seams. 
For the window glass, I'm using this clear plastic. I tape down the window frames, then cut out the footprints of the frames in the plastic. I didn't glue them just yet though, as I needed to seal and paint the frames first. The tiny vents and grills were an especially fun little detail on this build. While purely cosmetic, I felt they added a lot to the finished result and really helped sell the small scale. If you're doing this by hand, you can simplify these by printing and then just coloring in the vent holes with a black or dark colored pen. Also, I'm using super glue due to impatience, but white glue would have been a much more forgiving option. This detail here, also entirely optional, was a small drawer for the 9 volt battery, which would be added later to power the LEDs. It was the first time I'd put this much effort into not just hiding a battery, but making it easily accessible for replacing later. It was next time to work on the eaves, and one thing that really helped with precise gluing was these lines, which were engraved into the chipboard to serve as guides. It was next time to coat all of the chipboard in Mod Podge. I can't stress enough how important this step is. Without it, paper products like chipboard bow and peel when painted. To create this draped awning on the front of the market, I first needed equidistant pegs jutting from the wall. I mark these spots with a push pin and a ruler, then use this adorable pin vise to drill holes. That did leave me with a bit more texture than I wanted, so I've gone back and added holes to the downloadable template for your convenience. I then jammed a bunch of toothpicks in, waited for the glue to dry, then snipped away the excess. Next, to prepare for the LED lighting, I drilled tiny holes for the negative and positive leads in all the places I wanted to add bulbs. It was then on to building out the front room, which serves as the comm center and cockpit for the pilot to navigate the market from. This wasn't actually even in the original concept art, but I realized at this point that unlike a stationary building, this one would need a captain, and that captain would need a way to steer the vessel. Of course, all these control panels and console screens were probably unnecessary, but what is crafting dioramas if not a slippery slope of pursuing endless details and insatiable complexity? The back room, which was intended to be something akin to an open-air fish market, was a little trickier to build as I realized that the battery interfered with the original floor design. This meant designing a new floor with a ramp, which I guess makes sense anyway so that the fish guts and other wet stuff can drain out of the room. This tiled floor was fun to design, and while a little tedious to paint later on, the result was worth it. I want to share the latest apparel addition to my online store. This design, based on the little flea diorama, is a high-quality five-color screen print on a super comfy pre-shrunk cotton tee. I printed all the way to 3XL, but stock is limited, so if you want to snag a print before they run out, please visit GameyBuilds.com. At this point in my planet's history, Repulsor engines, which help ships repulse the Earth's gravity and allow them to hover without creating downward thrust, have become somewhat scarce. The one attached to this market, however, is only partially working and is unable to generate forward thrust, which is while the market must still rely on the winds to travel. For the area below the engine, I quickly designed and glued together this angled sled. Satisfied that it all fit properly, I began detailing the sled with these chipboard panels. It wasn't my intention for any of these tiny pieces to fall out like this, but I rather liked the irregular look, so I went with it. It was at this point that I also kitbashed some of the tiny mechanical bits for the market exterior. This one's made from Gundam parts and a laser cut piece of chipboard, and this one over here is a conglomeration of Gundam bits, wood, beads, aluminum armature wire, motherboard plugs, and some guitar string. For the engine, Taken from an old Nerf gun, I glued on some basswood rings, added a toy speaker, then some details from laser cut chipboard. Finally, some plastic greeblies and pipes.
For the deck that precariously skirts around the edge of the market, I first added a frame, also cut from 2mm basswood, then slid in a base for the slats to lie on, cut from chipboard. This made it easy to then glue in the crossbeams. Once the frame was down, I glued down the wooden slats, which are simply made from coffee stirrers. I went for this option because the wood is softer, making it easier to stain, but also more irregular than the perfectly cut basswood, resulting in a more convincing worn wood look. Once the glue dried, I snipped away all the excess and gave it a good sanding. It was then onto the sign, which was cut from 1mm chipboard and glued to a small rectangle of basswood, then attached to the building with toothpicks and superglue. For the generator unit seen here, I glued a few layers of basswood together, then glued on this edge cover with a bit of overhang, before finally adding other details like this grating and wire outlets. Since I'd worked so hard to conceal the battery pack, I wanted an equally inconspicuous switch for the lights. To achieve this, I drilled a hole into one of the lower walls, then added a button switch with a tiny circular grating on top. Next, after getting the 9 volt battery situated, I began the arduous process of wiring everything together. Fortunately, it required only one resistor, and I was careful to properly solder and seal all exposed wiring. I'm still extra terrible at soldering and just electric stuff in general, so feel free to give me tips in the comments. Eventually though, I did manage to get it all wired and working properly, and I was ready to move on. There's always that one thing in every build that ends up being a major headache, and for this one, surprisingly, it was the terracotta roof. My initial idea was to make a mold from polymer clay, so I rolled out a thick sheet of it, added indentations with a dowel, then baked. I then used that as a mold to imprint the pattern onto thin strips of clay, but while it felt and looked okay at first, the clay fused together and was impossible to separate. My second attempt was using air dry clay, waiting for it to dry, then dipping long strips of chipboard into water to soften them, then using those strips to make the terracotta roof tiles. But while this result was a little better, it was too thick and the scale was just a tad too large. I was getting a little frustrated at this point, but decided to scale down the tiles by using a smaller plastic dowel for the grooves. Then, I cut thin strips from thick poster paper, softened them with warm water, added a light coat of glue, and pressed them into the air dry mold. Had I been smart, I would have also added a sheet of wax paper to the top of the paper to avoid peeling, but the back sides were mostly intact, and after they all dried, I glued them layer by layer onto the roof panels. Success! Another thing that caused a significant headache was the sails. I settled on using wood skewers for the cross beams, called yards on ancient sailing ships. After staining them and these quarter inch wood dowels with rust brown enamel paint, I cut and folded these sails out of printer paper. A quick cream colored misting with my airbrush gave them more dimension, and then it was on to gluing the trim skewers onto the paper sails. I'm using tacky glue here, which is like normal glue that wears bright colors to funerals. With the glue dry, I super glued on some black thread for the sail rigging. I had to go super easy here, as I didn't want the glue drying glossy and visible, so just a tiny speck of glue here and there did the trick. I then cut down the dowels for the masts, then used my Hardell rotary tool to add a 2mm slot to each post to help them fit snugly into the cross beams below the terracotta roofs. It's been more than six months since I've used a pre-made wooden frame from one of my bases, and I'd forgotten just how convenient they are. They're cheap, durable, and so long as they match the footprint of the project, super easy to work with. After hot gluing aluminum foil down, I coated them in sheets of polymer clay to sculpt the waves. 
A spritz of isopropyl alcohol helped to soften the clay, and these ball styluses made for easy texturing. And now, it's on to the final bits of design, painting, and assembly. And as always, our short story. You are watching Gamey Builds. Thank you, and enjoy the bite. The great Aegean Sea churned in the enormous pocket engulfed by the crescent continent. At a smaller scale, this body of water could have been called a bay, but here the waves swelled and tumbled and roiled like any open ocean. Frenzied hurricanes whipped over the warm waters near the northern archipelagos, and pirates needled their way along the rocky coastline, prowling for easy prey. And it was the job of Tarkini Alwat to keep far away from all such dangers. Tarkini was the self-proclaimed captain of Banguale, a sky market, the odd marriage of a logistics container turned trading post and a repulsor engine, both having been liberated from an imperial salvage yard many moons ago under questionable circumstances. In modern times, such a brazen stunt would have surely earned one a ticket to a prison colony, but those were the lost days of vibrant excess, when hover ships and ornate repulsor yachts were common sights on the seas of Aegis. But now, Tarkini only saw two endless bands of blue stitched to one another by the thread of the horizon. The wind shifted, and the captain pivoted the sails to dance with the breeze. He detected something foreign in it, though, an acrid, alkaline smell he knew well. He checked the console displays to confirm his suspicion before leaning out of the window. Karasaba detected, not five kilometers from here. Better get your lines up, Milo, he shouted at a man perched over the edge of a dock that jutted from a craft like a tattered wing. Milo held a fishing rod in his hands and was dragging its line in their wake. He grumbled as he reeled it in. It had been a slow couple of days, their haul unimpressive. They would have little to offer if they ran into buyers, and he resented the interruption. But as Milo set his rod down and removed the visor he wore for detecting schools of fish beneath the waves, something caught his eye, a glisten just on the horizon. Replacing his headset, he zoomed in and dialed out the glare and found a man bobbing in the waves, his body draped over a sliver of flotsam. Tarkini! Tarkini! I see a thing! He said. What thing? The captain shouted back. A man! In the water! Could be dead! Tarkini joined him a moment later, donned the headset, and muttered something to himself before running back to the cockpit to redirect the sails. He brought the market around just over the man's position and dispatched Milo down a ladder to haul him aboard. The man was dressed in strange attire for a seaman, striped gray slacks, a white button shirt, and a burgundy coat from which a sleeve had been torn free. The captain prodded at him with the toe of his boot, a quick glance over for injuries. Satisfied that he was intact and in fact still among the living, he ordered Milo to leave the man in a shaded stall of a presently empty wet market. When the man finally awoke that evening, he was fed and watered, then set before the crew of two as the captain opened a large ledger on his lap and pulled a pen from his pocket. You'll give us your name then, Tarkini said, clearing his throat as he ran a finger down the page. The man gave them a distrustful look, his lips pressed together tightly. You're free to remain silent, but it'll bring you little advantage. Tarkini scoffed. We'll drop you off at the nearest island and be on our way. This seemed to loosen something in the man. He shifted uncomfortably and finally spoke. Mig Poyle, he grumbled. 
Poyo. That's an Ekrite name, isn't it? And high caste if memory serves. The man's only response was a glare. We're not pirates, Mr. Poyo, nor labor traders, Tarkini said. Then what do you want? Tarkini took a deep breath and smiled. Explain to me first why you, a high caste Ekrite in formal attire, were aboard a prison transport. Mig's eyes slid back and forth between the two men. Classified. I don't doubt it, Tarkini chuckled. I have here a ledger of all the prisoners in the colony systems. We fish them out of the waters regularly when the Kara Sabat decides to pluck a prison tram from the rail. About half survive the encounters, but your name isn't on this list. Your incarceration was sudden. A look of utter disbelief washed over the man's sunburned face. You rescue the fallen prisoners? There are a dozen or so skiffs and ferries that occasionally pull men from the waters, yes. We put them to work fishing and hauling freight until they can work off their fare back to the mainland to their families, where they belong. Then you are aiding in criminal activity, Mig announced. Tarkini only leaned back against the hull of the market and crossed his arms. If saving a soul from certain death is a criminal offense, I'll gladly put you back in the water, he said without malice. Beside him, Milo giggled. The trio fell silent, and for a long moment all that could be heard was the lapping of the waves beneath them and the purring repulsor engine. So what will it be then, Mr. Poyle? Passage aboard our vessel or deep diving with the Karasabat? Tarkini prodded. The man's expression soured as he turned to gaze at a sun melting silently over the horizon the last golden drops of light dissolving on placid waters. He thought back to the life he'd lived of almost luxury, his path from the university to the promise of one day becoming a trusted advisor to the king's council, a man who would want for nothing. How quickly that hope had fermented into bitter disappointment. Now it was just him, the shredded clothes on his back, and a reputation he could never return to. Tell me, Mig finally said, what price do you charge for safe passage to the mainland? I pay an honest wage. Eight weeks diligent work, one or two significant hauls. That had earned passage. And it has, many times, Tarkini said, holding a palm over his heart in earnest. Beside him, Milo nodded in confirmation. And what do you two make annually for your living? The corners of Tarkini's mouth turned downwards, and his shoulders raised in a slow shrug. Ah, enough to keep the repulsor engine and generators running, and for occasional visits to the Melshara taverns. We are not men of excess, the captain said, gesturing to a metal hull beside him, bulging with rust rot and streaked with oil stains. Mig's back straightened as a sparkle twinkled in his eye. What if I were to tell you that you could make a small fortune with this vessel? Tarkini leaned forward and nodded. I would tell you I'm listening. I possess knowledge of the location of a sunken treasure, a tram disguised as a prison transport that was sunk by a Kara Sabbat. The Ekrite Dominion assumed it was lost forever, but you men have proven that may not be the case. And your fee for this information? asked Tarkini. I provide the knowledge, you provide the hauling power. We split whatever we find three ways. Tarkini drew a deep breath, gave Milo a long glance, and reached forward to shake the man's hand.
Thank you all so much for watching, especially my lovely patrons who help make these creations possible. If you haven't watched my Prison Solution build yet, which is a tie-in to this story, you can check out that one here. If you're watching on your TV, you can also scan the QR code to jump to my website. Until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.